I want to take you back uh, three years to the very early days of the pandemic, first of all. The first few weeks, just before the first lockdown, a destabilizing, frightening time. And I want you to consider something. Where did you go for your information? Where did you naturally find yourself heading for information at that time, at that worrying time? Not necessarily who did you trust, but where did you go for information? Then I want to take you back further, about 12 years ago, to this time in 2011, to what seemed to be, at the time, the dawning of a new era, and that was the Arab Spring. It was a time of optimism. That optimism was encapsulated in the term itself. The implications of that spring, all those years ago, seemed to be truly global and potentially game-changing. Those implications, to remind you, surrounded what we were told at the time was the potential for social media to reverse historical flows of information. From top down to bottom up, networked communication. Technology that could facilitate freedom of speech in countries where that notion had either always been contested or banned. Some people even went further. They talked about the Gutenberg parenthesis. The idea that since the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg in medieval Germany, top-down communication by journalists, the media, authors, the clergy, represented an anomaly in human history. And that print didn't guarantee the truth, it just guaranteed a version of the truth. And actually, social media was allowing us to return to an older, more authentic way of communicating. The theory ran that social media allowed us all to express an opinion, and that would lead to true freedom and equality of expression. Users of social media, so the theory ran, would all have a built-in editorial nose. They would filter out the rubbish, and therefore the sharing function that's so central to the way social media works would guarantee the quality and validity of the information spread. Let's be kind and just say that that was a rosy view of human nature. And of course, those revolutions themselves also required thousands of people to put their lives on the line. But the optimism was real, and commentators soon began to link those Arab protests to other social movements across the globe, including those in the West at the time, like the Occupy movement, for example, if you remember that, the student fee protest. They were linked by network communication. Writers like Castells and Mason wrote extensively about those ideals. So I visited Tunisia, actually, less than a year after the revolution, which is where the Arab Spring started. The optimism was indeed real. The centrality of the media and free speech to the protest was undeniable. There were hub websites, news websites, a genuine excitement in the air, vibrant blogs, ideas that had never previously been sayable were spread via various websites and using social media. I also went somewhere else that year, in 2012, and that was Ukraine. And there I met a man called Yevhen Fedchenko, small, slight, goatee beard, stereotypical academic. I met him in a room much like the one I teach in myself, dusty, without windows. He was working at the time, and again, this is over 10 years ago, he was working on a new project called Stop Fake aimed at countering an enormous wave of Russian social media propaganda that they detected, him, him and his students in, uh, in Kiev. This is common in those countries of the former Soviet Union which had undergone colour revolutions ten years before the early noughties, where freedom of speech was often central to those earlier revolutions. So now let's fast forward to the present. Gone is the optimism of the Arab Spring the idea that what Manuel Castells called networks of outrage and hope, way back in 2012, bottom-up spaces facilitated by open social media debate, would quicken Fukuyama's end of history as the nations of the world all sought to become versions of enlightened Nordic social democracy. Everyone wanted to become Denmark, that ran the theory. But the evolution of that technology, actually over the last decade, of course, has been very different. Authoritarian regimes, for example, not only saw the risks of social media, but they actually saw within it an opportunity, both internally and externally. 
They saw within it the potential to spread propaganda, but crucially also to sow confusion and sow doubt. It's often much more subtle than just propaganda, in other words. Yevon Fedchenko, back in Kiev in 2012, saw that happening at an early stage of the technology. It was frightening. It led indirectly to the Maidan revolution in 2014 in Kiev and Ukraine. But it was something happening over there in post-communist countries, in Arabic nations, in countries that had never developed a functioning free press. But soon, things began to change in Western democracies, like ours. The fragmentation inherent in the new social media technology began to weaken trust in the notion of public service journalism, indeed in the notion of journalism itself. The very idea of a shared narrative with universally accepted truths began to be weakened and began to be challenged. So certain politicians across the West began to exploit this, realizing that they now had platforms that allowed them to evade journalistic scrutiny entirely, to communicate directly with their electorate, or to come up with easily digestible sound bites, to question the validity and motives of the mainstream media, to dismiss inconvenient things like facts. And so what we saw was consensus, consensus politics, giving way to polarization. The Gutenberg parenthesis proved to be coming true, but in an unexpected way. It seemed at times like we were indeed returning to the Middle Ages. Of course, healthy democracies depend on the quality of media that frames debate within them. Social media, artificial intelligence, they're challenging this. They've long challenged this. At times, they poison the public sphere, and at, at times, they compromise rational political debate. Now, from a British perspective, it could be argued that our tabloid press, our red top tabloid press, have always done this. But even at their worst, and their worst is pretty bad, uh, I would argue there's still a human dimension to the relationship they have with their audience. They may tweak their audience's prejudices. They do tweak their audience's prejudices. They may pander to those prejudices. They may have had a hugely damaging impact on our politics over many years, and I would argue they have. They may coarsen the public sphere, but whatever you could say about them, they don't treat that audience as an algorithm, as a collection of data. There is a human dimension to it. In contrast, a Guardian investigation recently revealed an Israeli private company profiting from the dissemination of disinformation on behalf of political and corporate clients. So alongside state-sponsored actors, Putin and so on, increasing numbers of private firms are involved in this kind of thing. So, in short, the journey from the Arab Spring to Trump and beyond has been extraordinary. We're now in a multipolar, fragmented, contested world, and that has happened more quickly and more definitively than anybody anticipated. We have authoritarian regimes challenging the basic conditions for open international order, and we have polarized societies across democracies. The authoritarian model combines automated disinformation, typically on social media, with hacking and the seeding of fabricated stories in the mainstream news. This is often quite subtle. Russian propagandists, for example, use social media to amplify voices that question the established narrative. Now, these are often left-leaning academics, for example, who may be doing nothing more than perfectly valid questioning of Western foreign policy, the disaster of the Iraq invasion, the hypocrisy of the West. But they're amplified. It may also be the far right, attracted by Putin's socially illiberal agenda which incidentally he uses to bolster support across the developing world and other parts of the former Soviet Union. According to the Brookings Institute, Russia doesn't pull its most outlandish narratives out of thin air. It builds on existing resentments and political fissures, and it exploits them. So we're seeing nothing less than the professionalization of a commercial disinformation industry, 
Profiting from lies and distortion is one of the clear threats of our time, wherever we see it. As with all technology, AI, social media, they offer obvious gains, we all know that. But they also offer the scope to blur the lines between the real and the fake, meaning that for us in democracies, with a 250-year-old tradition of free press, we're losing a shared sense of reality. So this all puts journalists, conventional journalists, who cleave to the ideal of objectivity in a difficult and uncomfortable position. It's essential to question the narrative. Indeed, it's a fundamental part of what we as journalists do, of what any critical thinkers do. But we need to do so from a position of authority where the principles of public service journalism are understood and defended. The solution is nuanced and requires us to defend and define impartiality in a hopelessly polarised world, where everybody has the right to reply and the means to exercise it, where there is evidence, in inverted commas, for any claim available instantly, and where it's perfectly possible to live your life in an echo chamber of similarly minded people. Again, the British press have always been echo chambers, but we know where this has led now. And the question then becomes, how can we define it? How can we defend the principles of public service broadcasting, the very concept of the license fee, for example, in the British context, in a fragmented media environment? The cliche about the BBC, to use that as an example, is that if it's being attacked by left and right, it must be doing something right. And of course, it is attacked by left and right. It's more complex than that in reality. Um, but whatever, the inherent nobility of the concept is something to be defended. It is, or could be, the antidote to polarisation. Would Trump, for example, have been possible if there was an American equivalent of the BBC? A far-reaching, universal, and that's the crucial word, universal, broadcaster, paid for and owned by the entire US population. The press is the guarantor of truth, or it can be. But it needs trust, and it has to be universal. That can rarely be delivered in a commercial world, um, and it can never be delivered by a government-funded service. So the BBC centenary last year should have reminded us about its origins. It was set up as a monopoly owned by all of us. That, of course, is incredibly challenging. Um, in direct contrast to what was already seen as the American model in the 1920s, a commercial free-for-all. It was obvious where that was going to lead. And if we consider things like Reality Check, which is one of the uh, news programmes that the BBC puts out, or the sorts of recent stories broken by international consortiums of investigative journalists, things like the Paradise Papers, the Panama Papers, if you can remember those in recent years, that's a very common model now. We can see what the real principles of journalism are. Or to put it another way, where did you go in the early weeks of the pandemic for information? This should be seen as a manifesto. We could perhaps think in terms of digital kite marks of quality, compulsory, not voluntary codes applicable to all forms of published content that ensures that it's gone through some kind of editorial process. But that model, whatever we come up with, needs people to appreciate the realities of journalism. You won't agree with everything, but not agreeing is not the same as bias. And it's crucial to see journalism and to understand journalism as a mechanism to help develop a point of view, not a tool to simply support one. Thank you.